Greetings in that precious name of Jesus. I'm Bill Steger and welcome to my study. It's time for our Sunday School lesson and we're in the fourth chapter of Proverbs today. Oh, we're going to see the same basic concepts of a call for wisdom and understanding as we walk through life. But the emphasis this time is very unusual and it's rather an exciting lesson. I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. You know, throughout my life, I've discovered, just like you have, that life is a journey. There are many choices along the way. And as you walk down that road of life, there are paths that go in different directions. And you have to make wise decisions. And sometimes it may not seem as obvious as you would like it to be. And so you need to be constantly in prayer and preparing yourself to make the right kind of choices in life. One of the things that helps to make the right choices is to know as much as possibly can about it. I've had the opportunity of living in different types of environments and I'm excited to learn about our environment. For example, as, as a boy my dream was to be an astronomer. So uh, I still just love staring up at the night sky and just taking in the depth and breadth of the Milky Way and the excitement of the universe itself. But without some kind of a guide, it's, it's hard to find your way around. You need to, to carefully prepare for such things as that. I enjoy sitting there and eating lunch or supper and staring out the kitchen windows and watching the birds and the animals and I want to know about them. And so over the years I've collected quite an assortment of field guides from everything from uh, mammals to birds to insects. I've just been curious of what's going on. In fact, <laughs> when my wife served in Africa we spent a year and a half on an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And so I found it necessary to get a coral reef fishes guide just to find out what was going on in that new and exciting environment to me. You know where I'm going with this. When we make the decisions in life, we need to know what the possibilities are. We need to know what's all around us. And there's no book like this one. It makes such a difference for us. But in today's lesson, Solomon goes further than this book. You see, there are things that are entrusted to us and that make a lasting impression because they've been hand-delivered to us. When I was growing up, my dad would say, tool and die maker, and uh, all his life he had bought machinery that he had in the basement, lathes and milling machines, drill presses and grinders of all kinds, and as a young boy I learned some of that trade. I can remember my dad standing there at his lathe working, and just opposite the lady had a blue stool. I had a lot of respect for that stool because when I had deviated from the path of life and done something wrong, I got invited down to sit on that stool and as my dad worked, he talked. As I got older, I called those the blue stool talks those talks made great impressions on my life. You see, my father shared with me values, morals, and they were things that he not only taught me, but he, he led me by example. And that's the emphasis in the fourth chapter. It's a different approach to wisdom Oh, as you know, the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs are not the collection of little proverbs that we see dominate the rest of the book, but rather they're 
a group of short essays dealing on the subject of wisdom and understanding the principles for life. And as we march through those nine chapters, we meet a lot of the decisions that we must make. And Solomon discusses things very bluntly and straightforward. We've defined wisdom as that practical knowledge that we need for life. In fact, in this fourth chapter, I called our study The Secrets for Life's Journey, because journey is the emphasis of the chapter. The word path is used four times. The word way is used four times. The idea of walking and running and our steps on the path are mentioned over and over and over again. For life indeed is a journey. And Solomon wanted his son to make wise decisions on that journey of life. Just like my dad wanted me to make wise decisions. But there's more to it than that, as we'll see in, in just a moment. The fourth chapter divides, like we've seen previously, the paragraphs, each one of the three paragraphs, begins with the concept of my son. And uh, the very first one says, Hear ye children. But actually the Hebrew says, Hear ye sons. And he's talking to all of his boys in the first paragraph, but then he goes back to his normal face-to-face -face personal encounter in the next two paragraphs in verse 10, hear, O my son, and then in verse 20, my son. So we'll use those three divisions once again. I invite you to pull down the outline that is on the web page at the church or the YouTube uh, that you might be listening to or the Facebook page and follow along the notes that I've put there and placed a simple outline for us to look at. Let's get busy now. So open your Bible with me and let's look at the fourth chapter of Proverbs, The Secret of Life's Journey. What we need to observe and watch and understand so that we can make wise choices as we go down that road. Sometimes the road marks aren't as clear as we want them and when we come to a fork in the road uh, we try to look to see what's ahead down that area but uh, it's not always as obvious as we like. So Solomon is pointing out how we can be aware of what are bad choices and be aware of what are good choices. So he wants his sons to make the right decision. And you want to make your children understand that as well. Now the first paragraph, beginning with verses 1, 1 through 9, he starts by saying, Hear ye, sons. And I want you to see that this is my sons hear from generation to generation. For this is an unusual approach. He has not done this before in the book of Proverbs, but he's talking to his son in the way in which his father, David, had talked to him. And he shares the importance of generation to generation. That's probably why he uses the plural, my sons, to begin this one, uh, instead of my son, as he's done over and over again. Because he's talking about the importance of us passing it on. It's not a matter of us receiving a body of tradition or a, 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 a catalog of values that we live by. We must learn how to pass things on. That becomes absolutely essential. In the New Testament, Paul picks up this idea. In the last letter he wrote, to Second Timothy we call it, Paul's in prison and he's expecting his death. And as he writes to Timothy and gives him his final instructions, in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he says, Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul reminds Timothy that he wants him to look not just father to son, but he wants to see four generations. He wants us to, us to grasp the big picture in life and realize that our faith is not just about adding people to our faith. We want to multiply, for it's in multiplication that there is dramatic transformation. And multiplication can only take place when we stop just looking at one generation to the next and begin to look several generations down the line. In that second verse that I quoted from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, did you know what he said? The things that you, Timothy, have heard from me, Paul to Timothy, Commit thou to faithful men, Paul to Timothy, to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. Paul to Timothy, to faithful men who will be able to teach others. It's not just about transmitting those values. It's about transmitting the necessity of transmitting those battles. We must always look at the big picture and realize it's not just about us. There is a future before us, a future of unborn generations, and therefore we must seek out the faithful who we can share with, who will realize they must share it, and they must share it with those who will grasp the need to share it. What a picture. It's a different way of viewing life. And it's what's on the heart of Solomon here. Let me read you those first four verses, which he speaks about a father or mother's instructions. Hear ye, children, the instructions of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender the only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, and he said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. Did you notice there's a lot of details in there? I, I wish I could explain further. He's talking about teaching, and he uses all the biblical words for teaching. The word he, he says very bluntly here, instruction, but then he talks about my law, and that is Torah. That is the word for instruction, too. And then he talks about my doctrine. That is the word for my teachings. So it's the idea that we must take the time to teach a new generation. Don't leave it up to the public school system. Don't even leave it to your Sunday school class. Realize that there is nothing like the impact of a personal encounter with your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. That as we share and move down the generations, there is something wonderful that takes place. He makes mention that his father talked about my commandments, and he's going to say in verse 5, my mouth, the things that came out of my mouth. The emphasis is in that David made this book his. God's law, God's instruction, God's teaching were not just on a pedestal over there. They became part of David's life. And so as David talked to Solomon, Solomon says, For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother, and he taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, and keep my commandments, and live. We need to have our children and grandchildren see that this is not just God's book. It becomes ours. It's not just some distant instruction that comes from heaven. It becomes a part of our life, a part of our thinking, a part of our behavior. It forms the framework for who we are. Our children are watching. They're looking carefully. If you're just reading from a book, 
they don't listen that well. But if they're reading your life, somehow the message comes with fantastic impact. For they can see in you that the words you speak, like Jesus, had authority. They had authority because they were lived. They were demonstrated. They were proven. That's what it's all about. And that's what we need to do. There are families that have passed on these values and morals. And there are values, families who have not passed them on. You and I must seek to grow those positive cycles of hope. And we need to try to quench those negative cycles of despair. We can break that negative link where a father or a motherless family has not been able to pass on those values. We can step in and make a difference, but the strongest impact comes when these words are lived. In verses 5, 6, and 7, he talks about wisdom's delight, and he does so in a rather interesting way. He says, I want you to get, that's the word for purchase. You know, I want you to make an investment. I want you to purchase wisdom and understanding. I don't want you to forget it. He puts it in the negative. I don't want you to forsake it. I want you to truly make a commitment to it. But listen as I read verses 5, 6, and 7. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not. And she shall preserve thee, love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom, and with thy getting, get understanding. Did you notice how he paints wisdom as a woman? And he wants his son to fall in love with her, to embrace her. He wants her to love her. And he's going to use that illustration several more times in this particular chapter. And then he, he talks about some of the rewards. And uh, he'll say more about that in the next two verses, 8 and 9. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thy head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory, shall she deliver to thee. The rewards she will preserve, she will keep, she will promote, she will honor, she'll give you this crown for your head. All those wonderful things. What's important in life? Is it the things that you collect and purchase and buy? No, says Solomon. Instead, make your investment in wisdom and understanding. Let it become truly a part of your heart and life, and the rewards will be great. In fact, you'll be amazed at how she preserves you, protects you. A little bit later, he'll talk about give you long life, how she will make your life meaningful. She'll promote you. She will give you honor. People will respect because you stand up for values. And she'll put a crown on your head, a crown of glory. There's a lot of crowns mentioned in Scripture. And wisdom wants to place this crown of glory on your head and mine. Now the second paragraph that begins there in, in verse 10. And it begins like each of these have. Hear, O my son. I didn't say anything about that word here this time because I mentioned it several weeks ago. It's repeated constantly in Scripture, but I need to reiterate that at this time. The word here in Scripture doesn't mean just to listen. It's a powerful word. It means to hear with the intent to obey. I gave you the illustration previously about my mother calling me to do something, repeating it time and time, and finally stomping her foot and saying, did you hear me? 
And she wasn't asking if I caught it on my tympanic membrane. She was asking if I was going to do it, if I was going to obey, if I was going to follow through. And that's what the word means in Scripture. That's why so many of the teachings and parables in the New Testament, straight from the lips of Jesus, end by saying, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. It's not calling us to listen. It's calling us to obey. In fact, when Jesus dictates those seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation, every single one of them ends with the statement, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Jesus is serious about us putting his words into action. In fact, he says that's the test of love. If you love me, keep my commandments. It's the doing it. It's the obedience that makes the difference. So Solomon's going to repeat that over and over again, not just in verse 1 and in verse 10, but throughout the whole book of Proverbs, he's calling upon his son to hear, not just to listen to this story I'm going to tell you, but to do it. So he says in this verse uh, 10 through 19, the longer passage we have in the middle, that my son, I want you to walk in eternal day. Walk in eternal day. And I'll have more to say about that eternal day in just a moment. But in this section, he uses the word way four times. He uses the word path four times. He talks about your feet running and walking and stepping and stumbling and falling. It's all about the journey of life that we're on. 10 through 13 talks about the path to take. That is, I want to teach you how to make right decisions. Let me read 10 through 13, then I just want to pick out a few words to emphasize. Hear, O my son, and receive my uh, sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many. I've taught thee in the way of wisdom. I've led thee in the right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall be straightened, that is, uh, unhampered, and when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her. She's thy life. When we make this journey, Solomon says, I want you to remember how I have given you instruction. Verse 13, verse 11 rather. He says, I have taught thee in the way that thou shalt go. This is a very, very important concept to me, and I want to get it across to you. As a parent, as a grandparent, you and I cannot just talk. We must take our loved ones along with us. He says in this passage, I have taught thee in the way that thou should go. Real instruction doesn't happen in the classroom or in your living room. It happens in the way of life as you walk through the path. Those blue stool talks, they happened when I messed up. And as I sat there listening to my dad, he gave instruction, practical instruction talking about the issue of whatever it was that I had done or failed to do. Solomon says, I have taught you in the way that you shall go. I mentioned my dad was a tool and die maker and that I had learned the trade growing up and that he had machinery in abundance in our basement. I was about 14. I needed a little money. And so I said, Dad, I, I, I need a few bucks. Uh, you have a job that I could do to earn something for something special. He said, yeah, I think I've got something. Come on. And we went out in the shop together to look. 
He pulled a drawing down that he had just received and he said, I just got this in the mail. It's a nice size job. I think you can do it by yourself and be fine. Let's go over the plans. And as he started to unroll the plan, I said, don't worry about it, Dad. I can read the blueprints. I'll take care of it. No, no, let's, let's just talk about it. I, I want to work through it with you. I said, Daddy, don't. I, I got it all settled. Don't worry about it. Now, we had a 14-year-old type of argument right there at the desk. Finally, he said, okay, okay, and he disappeared and went in the house. Oh, I spread those blueprints out on the desk. I studied them, looked at them carefully, noticed the tolerance and the finishes and and all the details that were there, the type of metal that was to be used. And I went and got a piece of steel and, and put it in the lathe. And I took a, a tool, went over to the grinder and sharpened it, put it back into the tool holder, and I started making the pieces, cutting out the different things that were necessary. My dad came in, looked over my shoulder, and he said, well, we've got a problem. I said, why? <clears throat> he said, well, the drawing calls for a mirror finish, and that looks pretty rough. In fact, it looks more like a screw. We need to, to sharpen that tool bit a little bit differently. I said, I did it just like you, Dad. I've seen you do it a hundred times. I know exactly how it's supposed to be done. Now, take the tool bit out, and let's go to the grinder. All right, and I took the tool bit out. And I stood in front of the grinder. He said, now, I want you to feel what I'm doing. It's not just understanding the principle. I, I want you to feel, and, and I want you to walk with me through this. And then he wrapped his big arms around me and grabbed a hold of my hands. I was holding the tool bed. And then he passed the tool bed across the wheel. And again, but all of a sudden, something I never noticed before. At the very end of the stroke, he made ever so slight a turn. He said, did you feel that? I said, yeah. He said, what I'm doing, you've got your tool too sharp. And it's so pointy, it's making a scratch mark. He said, what we want to do is to keep that tool sharp, but we want to just ever so slightly rounded so that when the tool bit passes over the metal, it not only cuts, but it also burnishes a little bit and gives that nice finish. Let's do it again. It must have been 20 or 30 times that I felt his hand guide mine. That's what Solomon's talking about. You see, real teaching isn't in the classroom. It's in the way, as you're walking, as you meet life, as you face its problems, as you have to make decisions. And he says, I want to be there in your life at that time. The next phrase picks up that same idea. I have led thee in right paths. I didn't say, there it is, go get it, boy. No. I was there with you. I led you down that path. We talked about those rough situations. We talked about those poor choices. We talked about wicked people and bad decisions. And we talked about right ones and how you can tell the difference. Solomon was not afraid to get involved in his son's life and growing up and let his son see in his own life the good and sometimes the not so good decisions that we make. In verses 14, 15, 16, and 17, he talks about the negative, the paths to avoid. Listen to the way in which he defines them with beginning with verse 14. Enter not into the paths of the wicked and go not into the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, pass away. For they sleep not except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the violent, uh, wine of violence. 
he's pretty blunt. He says, there it is. There's a path. You can go down that one. But it's an evil path. It's something you must avoid. Don't even start down there. The choice you make in your friends, you can tell the difference between someone who's made bad decisions and some that's made good decisions. I want you to make the choice of friends that are going to put you on the right path. I mean, evil men lie awake at night trying to think how they're going to cause people to stumble and fall and what they can get out of it. Don't be like that. Avoid such paths in life. Life is a journey, but you want it to be a journey down the right paths that will bring good positive rewards, not dishonor and disgrace and failure. Then in the last part of that paragraph, verses 18 and 19, are, well, these are some of my favorite words in the book of Proverbs. Listen to them and then we'll talk about these two verses. The path of light. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. He uses the word path and way once again. And path is a narrow way, and a way is a broad way, as Jesus describes in the book of Matthew. And here Solomon says to his son, the path of the just is light. It's a, it's a shining light, and it's going somewhere. It's going to a perfect day. But the broad path, the way, is of the wicked, and it's, it's dark. He con First of all, he contrasts the light with the dark, the way of the just with the way of the wicked. But there's more to it than that. He has something wonderful to say about that path of life. He says, the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day. When you start walking down that narrow path of the just, you will discover that the light grows brighter and brighter and brighter. In fact, you're not walking toward the end of a day. You're not walking into the night. The light is going to get brighter and brighter and you're walking into a perfect day. You're walking into a sunrise, not a sunset. I love the beautiful words of Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, as he picks up the baby John in his arms and blesses him, he talks about what the boy will be doing in welcoming in the Messiah. And in Luke 1, verse 76 following, he says this, And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercies of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. John the Baptist was to open the way for the coming of the Messiah, and the Messiah would be the day spring, the dawn. We are walking toward Jesus. We are walking toward the dawn of a new day. It, it's something so exciting because it's a day that will guide men not into death. He will remove us from the shadow of death. Instead, he will guide our feet to the ways of peace. The Bible ends in that beautiful section of the discussion of heaven in Revelation 22 that says there's no night there. There's no need of sun or moon or stars because he's the light. 
And this is what Solomon's talking about here. He says, when we begin to walk on the path of the just, we become a shining light that shineth more and more unto that perfect day. We are moving not toward a sunset, but a sunrise to the glorious joy and presence of the Lord himself. Then the final paragraph. Verse 20 begins, my son. And then it, it talks about our whole body from head to toe. It's amazing how many terms that he uses. And I call this last section, my son, ponder total discipline. He says that we must bring our total body into obedience and discipline from head to toe. And he wants to explain why. He starts with the ears and the eyes, because that's how we take in information. We see and we hear. Be careful. What you're looking at and what you're hearing makes all the difference. Years ago, when computer science was young, they had an expression called GIGO, G-I-G-O. Garbage in, garbage out. And it described the fact that the computer was dependent on what you put into it. And if you expect good answers, you had to put good information into it. If you fed it garbage, that's what was going to come out. And that's the message that's here. Starting with your eyes and your ears. If you feed yourself the garbage of life, that's what you can expect happening on your hands and feet and down the rest of your body. But if you put in the positive, if your life is guided by the principles and the morals and the values and, and the concepts that God has given us in his word, then you can expect life to bear positive fruit. I'm going to read the entire paragraph. I want you just to notice how many parts of the body are here and what he has to say about this journey of life. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from me the froward mouth and the perverse lips. Put far from me. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand or to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Did you get it? Head to foot, the whole body needs to be brought into discipline. Incline your ear, he said. Guide thine eyes. Keep thy heart. Guard thy mouth and lips. Ponder the paths of your feet. Turn not thy hands. Remove thy feet from evil. What is your life like? What path are you on? What are you looking at? What are you hearing? What do you feed yourself day by day? That's going to determine what your hands do and where your feet go what your lips speak. It's important for you and I to realize how vital it is for us to guard that heart. In the seventh chapter of Mark, Jesus has a very long section about this very issue with his disciples. He says, it's not about the things that are external to us. But it's what's in our heart that makes a difference. If our heart is evil, if we fed it all this negative stuff, 
Right. That's where all the adultery and murder and lying and stealing come from. But if we feed our heart the positive, why, that's where the positive actions of hand, the love, the compassion, the understanding, the patience, the forgiveness come from. Bring all of your body into subjection. Beginning with what you put in. Because those eyes and ears feed the heart. We've talked earlier that the heart means your mind. It's your intellect, your personality, your will. And that mind needs to be fed with God's Word and His principles. Wow, we've covered a lot of ground today. And I'd like for you to realize the importance of that verse we just read. Keep your heart, for out of it proceed the issues of life. Your mind, the mind of your children, the mind of your grandchildren, must be fed positive things. And those positive things will enter by what you say to them and what they see you do and how you act and respond. Think big. It's not just parents to children. Think bigger generations than that. It is parents to children, to grandchildren, to great-grandchildren, and it's for our children to understand what our parents have passed on to us. Get involved with making a difference, realizing that God patterns society on the family because the family is the pattern by which we learn the valuable things in life. Here, my son, God bless you.